morning. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be in Matthew 6 this morning looking at verses, well, verse, verse 9. Matthew 6, verse 9 is where we're going to be this morning. And I want to start by also saying happy Father's Day uh, to all the dads in the room. I was blessed to be raised by a dad that taught me so many things. I can never pay him enough respect and enough uh, tribute for the things that he taught me. He taught me about the value of hard work. He taught me um, about the importance of family. But more than any of those things, my dad taught me about the gospel from before I was even born. I would say nine months before I was ever born, uh, I began to hear the word of God. Um, I uh, learned the gospel from a very young age, and he led me to the Lord as a five-year-old boy. Uh, and taught me to love Jesus, and to serve Jesus, and to follow Jesus, and I am who I am today very much because of the influence of my father in my life, and I know a lot of you would probably say the same thing, so on this Father's Day, uh, in the middle of a culture that in many ways denigrates fathers, their role, their their presence in our lives and in our homes. I hope you have a chance uh, to wish your father a happy Father's Day today and tell him how much you love him. Um, we are walking through the Lord's Prayer right now. Well, last week I said that I am praying um, that a lot of us, if you need this, not all of you might. Maybe all of you are in a good place or many of you in a good place in your prayer lives, but I'm praying for a lot of us that we would have a, a prayer breakthrough because I believe there is much frustration in our prayer lives and disappointment in our prayer lives. And I think that a lot of the reason behind that is maybe we're doing it wrong. We're doing it the wrong way. Um, but knowing that you're doing it wrong, that's what we looked at last week, knowing that you're doing it wrong is just the first step towards having that breakthrough that you need in your prayer life. If you stop with what you're doing wrong but never see how to do it right, then you understand you're going to continue to experience the frustration discouragement and disappointment. I'm glad that Jesus didn't stop with verse 8. I'm glad he didn't stop right there at verse 8. I'm glad he didn't stop with don't be like them. Don't be like them. Don't be the phantom prayer. Don't be the phony prayer. Don't be the frivolous prayer. Do you have anybody in your life? Maybe your father was like this. Maybe someone else in your life was like this, but someone that only tells you what you're doing wrong but never takes the time to show you how to do what's right. You know how those people are. Sometimes I find myself doing that with my kids. Most of the time, I err on the opposite side. Most of the time, my kids are going to get like the overly long lecture on how to do what they're supposed to be doing, right? It's like, here's a 15-minute lecture on the importance of loading the dishwasher the right way, and here's how to do it. So that's what I show them in response to stabbing my finger with a knife, right, from last week. But there are other times in my home that I find myself just saying things like, no, no, no don't do it like that. Why are you doing it like that? But then I never take the next step to show them the right way to do it. I never tell them, do it like this instead. And that is just provoking your child. That's just provoking your child. If you don't show them what to do and all you do is tear them down about what they're doing wrong, then all you're doing is provoking them. And the Bible has a word to say about that, especially to fathers. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline, and listen to this, very important, in the instruction of the Lord. Provoking is easy. Discipline and instruction are difficult. They require more work, more care, but they're very important. And that's what Jesus is doing here in the Lord's Prayer. He's not just going to stop us with what we're doing wrong, but he's going to instruct us on how to do it the right way. That's what the Lord's Prayer is. Jesus moves from you're doing it wrong to do it like this. Verse 9 says, pray then like this. Pray then like this. The Lord's Prayer this is the first thing you can write down if you're a note taker and you don't already know this. The Lord's Prayer is a model prayer. If you notice how he puts it, Jesus doesn't say, pray this prayer. He doesn't say, pray these words. Is there anything wrong with praying the Lord's Prayer? 
Is there anything wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer? Of course there's nothing wrong with it. We talked about that last week. Most of us have recited it countless times. We prayed it in church last week. But if you understand what you're praying, and you're not just mindlessly repeating the words, it's perfectly okay for you to pray the Lord's Prayer word for word. I read a story this past week about a father who for years and years led his family every night before bed to pray through the Lord's Prayer together until it became embedded in the hearts of his family. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine to do that. But notice, that's not technically what Jesus says right here. He doesn't say pray this. He says pray like this. Pray like this. You can think of the Lord's Prayer as a skeleton. It's like a skeleton. The Lord's Prayer is like the skeleton for our prayers. And the skeleton provides the structure of, uh, to your prayers. It's what gives your prayer shape just the same way your skeleton gives your body shape. Now, you know this, but a skeleton or a body is much, much more than just a skeleton, right? But it's not less than a skeleton. You can't live without your skeleton, but if all you are is a skeleton, you're dead, right? See? The skeleton is wrapped with all of your muscles and your ligaments and your cartilage and your skin and your hair and your eyes and your nose and and your everything else. And it's the other stuff that makes your body rich and unique with the traits and characteristics that make you who you are. But it's the skeleton that gives your body the structure that it needs. And if you didn't have your skeleton, all you would be is just a big blob of mess just laying on the floor. Just a, just a mass of, of, of tissue and flesh laying on the floor, which, by the way, is what a lot of our prayer lives look like. That's what a lot of our prayer lives look like. They look like just big, indistinct blobs, just this mass of unconnected parts. There's no bones to wrap it around, and so there's no shape to our prayers, and there's no structure to hold it together. Do you ever feel like that with your prayers? Do you ever feel like you're just stringing together a whole mass of unconnected words that you're not really sure, and they have very little, if any, structure at all? Jesus said here, "Why why don't you put a little structure into your prayer life. Here's some bones. Here's a skeleton for you to wrap it around. And so the Lord's Prayer is a structure for your prayer lives. The Lord's Prayer is a skeleton for your prayer lives. And here's the structure of the the Lord's uh, Prayer in a nutshell. The Lord's Prayer is organized into four distinct parts. You have the opening address. That's what we're looking at today. Our Father in heaven. Then after the address, you have two sets of three petitions or, or requests each. The first set of petitions are all centered on God and his will and his purposes and his plan. I think that's very intentional, and we're going to talk about that next week, the God-centeredness of the Lord's Prayer. But that goes on. He says, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he moves from the the first three petitions that are all God-centered to the second set of three petitions, which are all about our needs. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then it ends in many translations, not in every translation. It ends in many translations with a benediction or a blessing. That's where he says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And that is not in the ESV. We may talk about why that is, but we are going to cover the benediction to the Lord's prayer when we get to it in a couple of weeks. So there's four parts, each with three sections each. That is the skeleton of the prayer. Now within that structure, within that skeleton, there are endless options for you to customize 
customize it. If your kids play video games, maybe they customize their people on the video game. My son spends more time customizing his men and his players on the video game than he does actually play in the game. But he's always taking the characters in the game and he's changing out their clothes and changing out their accessories and changing their, their hair, you know, and, and then uh, changing if it's a football game, changing their equipment. If it's a battle game, changing their weapons or whatever it is. And, and I walk in there and he's not playing the game. And he's like, Dad, do you think this guy should have this uh, arm sleeve here on his elbow? Or do you think you ought to have an arm wrap around his leg? You know, it's like, I don't know, son. I don't care. I don't care what the guys wear. Why don't you just play the game? But he loves to customize. He's always customizing. And your prayer, the Lord's prayer, is infinitely customizable. Here's the structure, here's the skeleton, but within that structure, within that skeleton, you can wrap it with different pieces of skins, different types of accessories, because there's always going to be different people for you to pray for, different circumstances in your life that need prayer, different events in our world that need prayer. It's not always going to be the same. It's always customizable, but the structure is the same. Pray like this. So it begins here, what we'll look at today, it begins with this address, our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven. We used to have, and every so often we still have this happen, not very often anymore, but we used to have people who would call the church and they would just start talking as soon as we answered the phone. Like we'd say, hello, uh, First Baptist Gowansville, and whoever it is on the other end would just start talking. No introduction, don't telling us who they are, no small talk, no politeness, just symbolically over the phone, just barge right into the office and get right to the middle of the conversation. The middle of the conversation. There was no beginning of the conversation. It was straight to the middle of the conversation as if we had been talking, you know, for 5, 10, 15 minutes beforehand. Now, don't sit there and try to think who this is and could this maybe be you. It's none of you, okay? It is none of you. you none of you have done this. You wouldn't be able to think of who it is uh, if you tried. But that is how a lot of us pray. That's how a lot of us pray. We, we just go straight into the middle of the conversation, no, no nothing beforehand, just, God, I need you to do this. God, I need to ask you for this. God, would you do this? Would you help me? God, would you do this and that and that and, and, and the other? You just bust in and you just start talking and you just start asking God for stuff. Now, listen to me. God does not need you to come in and introduce yourself to him. He knows who you are already, right? He, he doesn't need you to come in and, and have small talk with him. You don't have to start your prayer with, you know, God, how, weather sure is nice today. It's like God created the weather. He maintains it. He knows exactly how the weather is. He doesn't need to be like, you doing okay today, God? He's not asking for that kind of thing. That's not the point. The point is that you need to get oriented before you start talking. You go into his presence, get your orientation, then start talking. Have you ever walked into a room? I know none of you probably have done this, but you ever walk into a room and forgot why you came in there? Like you... You leave, you walk into the den, and you're like, I know I had a purpose. I know I came in here for a reason. I just cannot, for the life of me, remember what the reason is. If that's ever happened to you, you've been disoriented before, at least mildly disoriented before. You had your purpose, but you don't know what it is. So you, you spend a minute just trying to get your bearings and think about, now, why in the world did I, did I come in here? Why did I come in here? And we get disoriented sometimes in our prayer life. We go to God and we forget some things. We, we forget who we are sometimes in relation to him. We forget who he is in relation to us. We forget the purpose for which we come to him. We forget a lot of those things. When we come to God, we get disoriented. And that's what this, this address here does. Our Father in heaven, this reorients us. It reorients us. It reminds us who we are, who we're talking to, so that we don't just barge in and get right to it. Many people have noticed that about this address in the Lord's Prayer. Martin Luther called this a time of, of recollection, where we remember our situation and realize our standing in Christ before we proceed in prayer. So don't rush your prayers. Some of you just need to take a breath before you start talking, right? Just need to step back.
take a breath. You're out of breath before you even start. Sometimes you just need to silently recollect, silently ponder who you're talking to, who you are, what your purpose is. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, there's a sense, this is awesome, there's a sense in which every man, when he begins to pray to God, should put his hand upon his mouth. And he's quoting scripture. Job chapter 40, verse 4, Job says this, he said, behold, I am of small account, he's recognizing who he is before God, I am of small account, what shall I answer you? Some of us are so quick to talk back to God. And Job says, I'm of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand upon my mouth. So this is how we orient ourselves to God. We don't just barge in. We go quietly into God's room like this. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. So in the time we have left, I just want to take a few moments and briefly outline to you how to address God in prayer. This is the address. How we address God in prayer or how we orient ourselves before God. So number one, before you pray, before you pray, before you launch into the middle of the conversation, number one, remember the community that you're surrounded by. Remember the community you're surrounded by. If you notice in verse 9, our Father in heaven, if you notice all throughout uh, this prayer, all of the first person pronouns in the Lord's prayer are in the plural. Every single one of them. None of them are in the singular. They're all in the plural. They're all our Father. Give us. None of it is about me and my and mine, it's all in the plural. Now, it's easy to read over that and not think anything about that and just sort of pass over it thinking it maybe it's accidental or just a, you know, it's just a matter of grammar or choice of words or whatever. But I don't think that's what that is. I think there's a significance to that. I think there's an importance to the fact that Jesus teaches us, us, to call on our Father, to give us our daily bread, forgive us of our uh, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's all in the plural. What do you think is the significance of that? If you had to think about it, and not, we're not answering, but think about it. I'll tell you what I think. I, I think it's to remind us that we're part of a bigger whole. We're, we're part of something bigger. We're not an island unto ourselves. We're not the lone rangers. We're not every man for himself. I've said this, I don't know, two dozen times over the past two years. Your Christianity is not just about you. It's not just about you and God. You are a part of a community that the Bible teaches is bigger and more in number than the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. That's the children of Abraham. That's the family that you're a part of. That's the community that you're a part of. But we don't always pray like that. We get disoriented. Sometimes we think we're in the room by ourselves, and yet we're surrounded, at the very least, by a great cloud of witnesses that has gone on before us. We are a part of a bigger whole. And that affects the way that we pray if we orient ourselves in the right way. I talked to somebody recently, and they're going through an incredibly difficult personal time in their lives, in their family, in their home. And they said, they made this statement, I've probably said something like this before more generically, but they specifically made this statement that when they come to church, they feel like they're the only ones in the room that are going through what they're going through. They're the only ones. That is, they look around the room, they're the only ones that are suffering through the kind of thing that they're going through right now. No one else suffering that same way. And you know what? That is a shame. That's a shame. It's not supposed to be like that because you know what that means? It means that we have, as a church, successfully isolated people from ever opening up to us so that we can pray for them by tricking them, we might not mean to, but by tricking them into thinking that we all have it together, and we don't. We don't all have it together. Some of you don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. 
But we give the impression that we do. And we don't. I shared this on Wednesday night at our prayer meeting. And again, I'm not guilting, not shaming. If you can come, you can come. If you can't, you can't. It was a little less crowded than the week before. I would encourage you to come. It is a good time of prayer. Um, but I shared this at the, the Wednesday night prayer meeting. We were praying for, for marriages and, and for families. This week we're praying for, for children. We we're praying for marriages this week. But I shared on Wednesday night about a time pretty recently when Bl- Brick's blood sugar, just, it just dropped. Her blood sugar dropped real low. She got weak. She got woozy. She got dizzy. She just needed to lay down. And she was so weak from her blood sugar being low that she couldn't even get off the floor. She couldn't even lift her own head up. I was just talking to her. I was in the kitchen, and I'm talking to her, and then I didn't hear her again. I didn't know where she was, and I looked over, and she's laying in the floor. I'm like, what is going on? Her blood sugar's low. She couldn't get up. And so I grabbed the cup, poured some orange juice in it, got a straw. I went over. I sat down on the floor with her, sat down beside her. I lifted up her head, laid it in my lap, and gave her some orange juice that she sipped on and sipped on until she finally got the strength to be able to get up and to be able to move over to the chair and get herself feeling better. How many of you know that all of us need someone to lift our heads up from time to time? We all need that. Someone to help strengthen us when we're too weak to stand up spiritually. And all of us have those moments when we're too weak to stand. And we need somebody to lift up our head. And that's what prayer is. That's what intercessory intercessory prayer does. It's us lifting up the heads of other people, helping strengthen them until they can stand up. Let me ask you a question. How many of your prayers are in the singular? How many of your prayers are self-focused? How much time do you spend remembering your brothers in Christ, your sisters in Christ, and not just the sickness that they're going through, but the relationship problems they're going through, the spiritual problems they're going through, the discouragement that they're going through, the heartbreak that they're going through? How many of you spend time in your prayers remembering your brothers and sisters in Christ, lifting their heads up and holding them up before the Lord until they can stand? Ken Hemphill made this statement. He said, our prayers rarely escape the tight confines of our homes, bills, and daily bread. Our prayers are too small. Are yours? Are your prayers too small? Are your prayers too confined to your house, your needs, your bills, your food, your situation? What's amazing to me is that we can spend, and you'll find this, you try it try this. You can spend the bulk of your time praying for someone else and find that God is always meeting your needs in the process. Because isn't that the fear? That's the fear. Like, boy, if we don't do it, who will? I got to pray for me. I got to spend time on me because if I don't do it, who's going to pray for me? But what you'll find amazingly is that if you spend your time lifting other people's heads up, praying for other people, trying to, to, to strengthen other people, that God will always be meeting your needs in the process. It is a beautiful truth of the Christian life. The more you remember others, the more you'll find fulfillment yourself. So remember, orient yourself, get, get, get your, in your mind that you are surrounded by a community of other believers. You're surrounded by others who need you and who you need, whether you know it or believe it or not. Number two, before you pray, remember the family you belong to. Before you launch into the middle of the conversation, take a moment to remember the family that you belong to. So not only do we pray remembering our brothers and sisters, but we pray to a God who has revealed himself in this radical and unique way as Father. I say radical because we just take it for granted now, don't we? We've heard that all our lives, that we are to call on God as our Father. But that is a radical concept. It is a unique concept. I look at it like this. We take it for granted because many of us have been calling God Father for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's like if you were the child of a king... And you always grew up in the king's court. You wouldn't think anything about being a king's son, would you? 
But if you grew up a homeless boy, if you grew up a street urchin, if you grew up with no uh, parents at all in your life from uh, just scavenging for food on the streets or whatever, but the king came in, swooped you up, adopted you, and brought you into his house, you'd never forget that, would you? You'd never get over that. And that's what Jesus is teaching us when he tells us to call God Father. God has brought us into a new family. He's taken us off the streets and brought him in to this palace. But in our culture, this word Father, when we call God Father, that word Father conjures up a a mixture of all sorts of things, both good and bad. But right here, it's not the bad things that it conjures up. The overriding thought that Jesus is teaching us is that God is personal and he's loving just like a perfect father see some religions many religions most religions view god as this impersonal force who's too distant to be fooled with he's too big to approach he's too great to enter into his presence but that is not the case with the god that we believe in the god that jesus reveals to us as father he is personal and he's loving you can think of it Here's the way I think of it anyway. When, when Brooke and I were dating um, a, a long time ago, sometimes, early on, sometimes it didn't go perfectly. I know that probably surprises you. I thought it was always a, like a smooth, rocky romance story or whatever, but sometimes we had our problems. Sometimes it would be a little bit difficult. And on nights when I came home and I was frustrated or I was discouraged, Um, or I was challenged, or I was unsure about what was happening and where this thing was going. On nights when I came home like that, do you know who was always sitting waiting for me? Always. My dad. Good and bad times, but he would always be there. I'd walk in, and I could still remember this so clearly. I'll never forget it. I walk in through the kitchen and into the den, and there is my dad sitting in his chair. Dads always have chairs, don't they? He's sitting in his chair, and he's watching TV or reading the paper. I know nobody reads the paper anymore, but he always read the paper. Just sitting there, and that was what he was focused on. But I would come home discouraged and frustrated, and I would walk over to the couch, and I would just plop down on the couch. And I wouldn't even say anything. I didn't even have to say anything. My dad was there, and in that moment, he would stop everything he was doing. He would mute the television or turn it off. He would put the paper down, and he'd say, what's wrong? Let's talk. And I would go through and I would explain to him what the problem was. And he would guide me. He would give me wisdom. He would direct. I had to make my own decision, but he would give me that that counsel there. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. He was waiting for me. I strive to be that for my kids, and I fall short a lot, a lot. But that picture I have of my father in his chair, waiting on me to come home, ready to listen. That is the way that I picture our Heavenly Father waiting for us. He's not too busy running the universe. He can mute the whole thing in just that moment, just so he can listen to you. He will put down the paper for you. He's not going to turn you away. He's not going to do like I sometimes do when my kids keep coming into my room like a revolving door and I just want some peace. He's never going to treat me that way. No, he is there. His door is always open, and he wants you to come in and amazingly radically, incredibly, he wants you to call him Father. Paul says in Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, by whom? By the spirit, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. God is personal. God is loving. God welcomes you to enter into his presence. He's not too busy for you. He wants to hear from you. Always remember as you orient yourself, remember the community that you're surrounded by. Remember that the, the family that you are now a part of, that you weren't always a part of, but now you are. Remember that. Our Father. Our Father. And then number three, remember the authority you're under. And I'm just going to be brief on this. Remember the authority you are under. He says in verse 9, our Father in heaven. In heaven. Now by telling us about our Father in heaven, he is not telling us so much about God's location. 
as he is telling us about his sovereign power and his authority. That's what the fact that God's in heaven means. It doesn't just mean he's somewhere else in some other realm or some other location. No, it's telling us about his authority, about his sovereign power. Yes, he's in heaven, but the point is not just that he's there, but that he rules over it. He rules over heaven. He rules over earth. He has all of heaven's resources ready and waiting at his command. They listen to him. They will obey him. That means he's God from his vantage point as the sovereign ruler of heaven. He has got unlimited resources to meet your finite needs. So that means you will never encounter a situation or a challenge or an obstacle or a problem that your Father in heaven is not equipped to deal with. You can't meet a, a, a situation he's not equipped to deal with. I don't care what it is. So that fact there That he's our father gives me confidence to enter into his presence. But the fact that he rules and reigns over heaven and over earth and that he has all authority in those places gives me confidence. Not just to enter into his presence, but that he will answer the prayers that I bring to him. So I remember my place. I remember my position. Yes, he's a father. Yes, he's loving. Yes, he welcomes me into his presence. But I also need to always remember the absolute sovereign power and authority of the God that I am talking to. Has anyone ever asked you, who do you think you're talking to the way that you're talking? Remember that. We, he's our father, but we respect him. He's our father, but we submit to him. He's our father, so we obey him. He's in the place of power. He's in the place of strength, and I'm in the place of submission. Don't ever forget when you go to the Father in prayer, who's in what position? Know your position. He's over all things, and you're under his authority. So Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Here's the structure. Here's the skeleton. This is how you organize your prayer life. So how do I orient myself before God in prayer? If you're disoriented, if you've walked in forgetting who you are, forgetting who he is, forgetting what you came for, whatever, you need to take a moment, don't barge in, don't go straight to the middle of the conversation like so many of us do. So take a second, recollect, reorient yourself around these truths. Remember, The community you're surrounded by, it is not just you. Remember the family you belong to. You come to a father who loves you, who welcomes you into his presence. And remember the authority, the power, the sovereignty of the God who is in heaven. When you pray, pray like that.